So you're comfortable looking at stuff on the DB2. Please go through the documents, go through the samples I gave you. And so when I talk about it on Monday, you are ready for it. If you're not ready for uh, the talk, and I, because um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over stuff that you should have read on your own, then that will be on you. But I'm sure you will look through it and then uh, ask good questions so we can um, really get to how to write a DBQ. But we're going to do the class on Thursday. So when you come in on Thursday, you can have the documents. You also have that tips on how to write it. And you'll have your outline, brainstorm list. You have all that material in when you come in and sit down and start writing. And you will turn in your outline. You will turn in the brainstorm list. I showed you outlines and brainstorm lists in class, but I also gave you samples. If you look on the postings, the samples are there. In fact, for today's post on Teams, I gave you a link to, I think, probably five different outlines. Just to give you an idea, we've talked about them before. A lot of you did them, but you have to be organized for this. It's shocking how fast time goes when you're writing a DBQ. Because you're thinking, okay, I got to get the documents in, I got to get the material in. And if your mind starts, if you start thinking about that, your mind starts going to that, you're not writing, you're not working. So when you come in, you have to be organized and ready to write. I will have no sympathy for you when I grade your essay. You come in without your outline. I will have no sympathy. You will get what you get. And if you don't finish, you don't finish. So you got to come in here organized, ready to go. In fact, that's the wrong word for it. I will be annoyed with you. <laughs> I will be annoyed and you'll be graded accordingly. I'm human. I will get annoyed. You want to keep me unannoyed. Is that a word? Unannoyed? I like it. All right, stick with it. Unannoyed. Okay. So please look at that. Okay, next. Let's go ahead and then let's go do a quick review. So Kansas, Nebraska, who broke it up? Did I say Kansas, Nebraska? I'm sorry. A compromise of 1850. Who broke up the compromise? That got it passed. Douglas. Yeah, the little giant. There he is again, which, by the way, is a bad picture for somebody dubbed the little giant. Because when you're standing there trying to point up, and I use this picture on purpose, and you're looking up at somebody, that makes you look like you're subservient. <laughs> if you want to be a person who wants to be president, you want to be looking down, at least for the picture itself. Yeah. Do you know who our shortest president was? Sure, James James Madison. How tall was Madison? Five three. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, he was small. He was a uh, very very difficult child birth, and then he was sick for months. And so he he um, a, a number of times he thought he was going to die. You know, as, as a kid. And so so we just never had the you know just yeah, he swims behind. Good for James Madison though for not dying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of good, yeah, I mean, the father of the Constitution, I know there's good and bad parts, and he immediately noticed, like, five years later, ooh, I screwed up there. But <laughs> he had to be very, very public about it. <laughs> like, ooh, that electoral college. Ooh. <laughs> he was saying that by 1801. But anyways, uh, um, so Kansas, Nebraska, and there'd be, what, what would they ban in Washington, D.C.? Was it slavery, like, Clay originally won it. What would they ban? And who said, we can't pass the compromise. We need two presidents. John. C. Calhoun. And the magnet stick. Oh, by the way, in class, I talked about, I had to be home and I talked about Davy Crockett. There's a finger pop of the Davy Crockett. All right, how are you guys doing? Did you see my lips move? Trained ventriloquist. Amazing, isn't it? Hi. Okay. And, like all front men, the head was magnetic. Okay, so. Uh, we have that, Kansas, Nebraska. Oh, what were, who were the uh, mostly southern pirates, soldiers of fortune, and went down to try to take over Latin American states and turn them into slave states? Filibusters. Yeah, filibusters. What was the doctrine or manifesto that said the U.S. should get Cuba and make it into slave states. Awesome. Yeah. And Cuba's going to be on the mind of Americans. It's kind of still is because it's only 90 miles. We kind of always saw it as our island. That would be the excuse for the Spanish-American War, 1898. And then Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote what book? Uncle Tom Scavenger. Who wrote it or who died on July 4th, 1860? 
after eating delicious ice cream and cherries? And who wrote in to save the day? Not Fillmore. Raul C. Calhoun. All right, well, one more time. Remember the personal liberty laws? There we go. That's a, he did a great job. Okay, so we got to right here, didn't we? So let's go and get going. Kansas, Nebraska, 1854. So, yes, the champagne came out. They saved the country, they thought. And probably, but still. But there's all these issues going on. Anger over the Fugitive Slave Act and the personal liberty laws. Uh, the South was absolutely, con absolutely convinced that abolitionists were going to stir up a slave rebellion. And then here's Stephen Douglas. Illinois wants to be president. And he would be behind a bill called right, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And what the deal was this. If he could get a massive legislative victory, he thought he could run for president, probably not 56, but 1860. That's what he's thinking. 1860, which he would run for president. And what he wanted was a northern route to a proposed transcontinental railroad. Now, don't think in terms of a railroad that actually stretched sea to sea. It was a railroad, and it's going to have government aid, but nobody knew how much. And that means the people are going to help pay for this thing. He wanted a one that was starting in his hometown of Chicago and go to San Francisco. Now, to our point of view, it doesn't seem like the northern route. But the proposed southern route was New Orleans or Memphis, and then up here. That's why they bought that Gaston purchase. So right here. And if he could get the start of that railroad to connect California to the rest of the United States, what a great coup, wouldn't it be? Like, I got that railroad, vote for me. The problem is this. This is still technically unorganized territory. It's administered by the United States Army, the Department of the Missouri. You're sitting on what was unorganized territory. I know the people who live there didn't see it that way. But they need a territorial government. They need a government for this. But remember the Missouri Compromise. No slavery in the Louisiana Purchase north of what line? Yeah, 3630, right there. No land north of this. You could have slave, slave codes. So Douglas first, okay, we just go to governments without slave codes. And what did the fire eaters say? Remember the fire eaters? What did they say? They got to be open to slavery or we'll do what? Rebel. Yeah, secede, which is a rebellion. We'll blow up the whole thing unless you give us what we want. Or, Douglas, you want your northern route? We'll stop it and make it go through New Orleans, then through Texas and this one. Is that what you want? Why not hold it? Well, that's kind of what's going to happen. Because that would be the Southern Pacific, and this would be the Union Pacific, Central Pacific. So it kind of would happen, but that's after the Civil War. And so Douglas, he realizes the Democratic Party, I need the South. I need the South. And so he made a deal with Southern Democrats and some Southern Whigs to do this. The Kansas-Nebraska Act would do these two things. It repealed the Missouri Compromise. And the Missouri Compromise was almost like uh, this. The Missouri Compromise was almost like this uh, uh, religious document because it saved the Union back in 1820. 36-30 meant something, even though it only, only applied but to this massive area in Brown. And then it said popular sovereignty in those two territories. Their territory, Kansas and Nebraska. You are sitting on what was designated Nebraska territory in 1854. And they passed this law almost air, uh, almost, what am I saying? Every member of the South, every, every member of Congress of the South, Whig or Democrat voted for it, and just enough Northern Democrats voted for it to get it passed. It passed. And this literally blew up the country. And write this right now. I didn't put this down. Everybody write down this. The Whig Party died. This destroyed the Whig Party. Absolutely destroyed. 
Because Southern Whigs voted for it, Northern Whigs voted against it for different reasons, but they voted against it, and the Whig Party could not survive. Now, it, it wasn't like immediately dead, but um, it, it's a, it was a mortal wound, and both sides would be picking away at or, or the new political parties would do this, pick out way at it. So here's popular sovereignty, and here's the other thing. The law said, we will let them decide down the road. But if we let them decide down the road, just like Utah and New Mexico, these will be open to slavery. So I know it's going to be weird for you to think about it, but you're sitting in a land that had slave codes. Now, nobody actually from the United States, almost nobody lived in what is now Montana. The nearest, uh, there was a, some fur traders in Fort Union in the mouth of the, with the Yellowstone ones in the Missouri, and a couple places west of the continental divide, but that was still part of Washington territory. The nearest federal fort was Fort Laramie down here in Wyoming. But still, is that weird to think about? Now, it'd only be for a couple of years, but still, there are slave codes here, technically. And so with that, unbelievable what happened. But the first thing was, okay, Kansas, that's the fight. Will they be slave or free? And people started pouring into Kansas. Now, some of you, they wanted the land. But people also came with a political agenda. Free soilers poured into Kansas. And that would begin what we call bleeding Kansas, which was civil war. The civil war began in the United States in 1854 in Kansas. Irregular guerrilla fighters, more like raids, harassments, and terror, begin to attack each other. Almost all of it were in this area here. So like Lecompton would be a, a, a pro-slavery town, Topeka, Lawrence, they would be free soil. But you also notice one more thing. The slave state of Missouri is right there. So people would cross back and forth very easily. Now the free soilers poured in and they would be called, and that's why I put this up here, an ad form, Free soilers are going to be called Jayhawkers. The Jayhawkers. So if you know anything about mascots of college football teams, that's why the University of Kansas are the Jayhawks. Because they're Jayhawkers. Just like I told you during the war or Mexican, Mexican War, uh, Tennessee became the volunteer state. And the Jayhawkers formed their own irregular cavalry. They called them red leggings. So they all had red either red pants or red leggings on their boots, and then they just wore whatever they had. But they were the red legs. And it'd be a brutal, violent guerrilla war. I mean, these kind of wars aren't ones that are gonna have a lot of prisoners taken. There would be huge fights, but there, there's a bloody, destructive conflict that would go from 1854 to 1865. And I should add these free soilers, yeah, they were totally opposed to slavery. But they didn't want equality. They wanted Kansas to be a white state. So racism was pretty strong. So that's another red leggings right there. That dog ran the whole operation. His name was Steve. And so with that, border ruffians would be the name given to all pro-slavery people. And even though a number of people would come into Kansas who wanted slavery, even brought slaves in, a lot of the border ruffians were people who crossed over the border from Missouri. So on the left is a border ruffian raid, and that's, uh, oh yeah, this is actually bringing over border ruffians across the Missouri to go vote in the election. Here are Missourians lined up to vote for the Constitution. Because in 1856, it was impossible to tell where you were from. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, it's almost impossible to vote, uh, um, to illegally vote today. It's virtually, in fact, it never happens. But back then, it happened all the time. But now it never happens. Uh, yeah, never. Did they catch somebody try to uh, do a, um, try to get a uh, absentee ballot for their mother who died? And he tried to forge her signature. This was in Pennsylvania. And then it just never happens here now, despite what people say. <laughs> but Board of Ruffians. And the biggest first really big fight 
would be the sack of Lawrence of 1856. The sack of Lawrence. May 21st, and in, in the next five or six days, the whole world will be turned upside down. Border ruffians cross over and attack the free soul town of Lawrence, Kansas. They shelled it, they attacked it, and then they went crossed back over the border. And the big thing is they pulled out a couple of cannon. Their militia had cannon. They took a great glee in attacking this the main hotel there, which was called the Free State Hotel. Get it? Get it? And but when Free Soilers and Jayhawkers heard, they heard it was a massacre. And this painting shows border ruffians lining up people and shooting them and shooting a father in front of their family and burning down the town and murdering people. It wasn't quite like that. They just came in and destroyed. The whole plan was to intimidate people to run away. Because there were a heck of a lot more free soilers. Heck of a lot more. And do you see it? Do you see it? More dogs. How does that fit in your conspiracy theory? Okay. Well, this came out by telegraph. It got back to Washington, D.C. the next day. And they're all talking about this. That and a lot of northerners are saying southern fire eaters are agitating massacres like this. Now, was it quite a massacre? Do you remember like the Boston massacre and some of the events in Boston? How patriot propaganda would spread that as something much bigger than what it was, even though it was awful. That's what happened here. So on the floor of the United States Senate, it went there. And what's going to be called, and I put this as the name of the speech. Charles Sumner gave a speech called The Crime Against Kansas. And it, he laid out that he saw Southern fire eaters are the ones who did this. In fact, there he is right there. He was a friend of Zachary Taylor, which kind of shocked everybody. He's from Massachusetts. He was an abolitionist. He was a Whig. But remember I told you the Whig Party blew up and a new party was created. Gee, I wonder what party, and I'll talk about its creation in just a second. That's the beginning to the Republican Party. So another Republican Party. And we'll get to it in a second. By the way, you like this picture? He's trying to look like a fighter. Because they're so tired of being bullied by the South. That's the way they look at it. He gave a speech where he blamed fire, eater, fire eaters and mentioned one by name, Andrew Butler. Now, I cannot describe that look. He looks odd. Huh? He looks kind of high. High? Yeah. <laughs> he does have like, yeah. And they they paint, they would take portraits and they would paint the face to make him look white. So now he just looks like, yeah, un, like, yeah so unemotional with the hair. It's, it's interesting. Look, he attacked him by name on the floor of the United States Senate. The next day, Preston Brooks, right there, whose nickname was Bully, his nickname actually was Bully. That's his cousin. He's a member of the House of Representatives. And he was furious at Sumner bringing dishonor to his family. How dare you? And by the way, Butler had just given this speech talking about how we have to attack the soils. I mean, Sumner wasn't far from the truth. Yeah. Is Brooks related at all to like that? Not that I know of, no. Okay. And so think about the Senate chambers at this time. When the Capitol was first built, there weren't that many states. The Senate chamber, it's now called the old Senate chamber, was about the size of this classroom. And once you had over 60 senators, can you imagine how packed it would have been? So they had this tiny little desk bolted into the ground so people couldn't move them just to have a little bit of space. He was over six feet tall, which was tall at that time. So he had to kind of fold into his little tiny desk, much smaller than you have here. Consider yourself lucky. You're welcome. But Sumner was on the aisle, and Brooks decided to get his revenge for this, for him dishonoring his family and, and bringing disrespect to his name. So the little tiny gallery, so the seats above were filled in the morning, which was unusual. And this is back when senators actually did their job. And so they were actually sitting in the Senate. If you know anything about the Senate today, they're never in the Senate. They're never there. They're in their office. They're raising money. They're talking to lobbyists. They're raising money. 
Around they're raising money. What? Flying around in their private jets. Yes, while well, raising money. Did I mention they raise money? No. Money's not money doesn't buy votes though. But moving on. <laughs> but so they're in their seats, they're sitting there. And there are all these people watching. And they're all friends of Brooks. And they're like, yeah. And a few people know what Brooks is gonna do. He's from the House of Representatives, but he walked in without warning. Now this is gonna hurt a little bit. But it's worth it, right? It's, it's all for charity, right? Okay. So, Sumner is facing the front. Brooks walks in, and everybody got quiet. And Sumner had no idea. And go look at me. Sumner walked in, and he said, <laughs> just literally walked in, um, you have brought disrespect to my family. Please prepare to defend. And he starts beating with this cane. Beating him across the head and the neck, hard. Yeah, yeah, by being a sociopath, but or a psychopath, just beat him, nearly beat him with that blood just starts spewing out. I mean, it was a horrible wound. In fact, he was hurt so bad that he would be knocked unconscious, and spinal fluid was coming out of his nose. He'd be bedridden for four years after this. Summer tried to get out of his desk, but bolted in, remember, and he hardly fit. He actually ripped it out of his bolts and then collapsed on the floor. Other senators tried to rush to his aid, but Southern senators knew what was gonna happen and they kept them from getting him. They kept him until Brooks walked out. Bully was quite appropriate. There's the cane, and for reasons that I don't understand, it's in a bank in Boston. <laughs> okay, why not? This big hat, and it was a prominent thing for gentlemen to have a cane. This is a cartoon, and it does show a little bit like they're trying to keep people from coming. And I love Southern senators, how they draw them. <laughs> and in the gallery, Brooks friends started chanting, beat him, kill him, beat him, kill him. So they're willing to murder, potentially, because that could have easily killed him. A member of the United States Senate because he opposed the system of slavery. And so with that, the Southerners consider themselves very chivalrous, noble, gentlemen. And here it says argument. And there is Sumner, and then you see it says Kansas. That's the crime against Kansas. So he's just trying to make a debate on the floor of the Senate. He didn't personally attack Butler, but still. And look at that's a good one. Here's the deal. You can't be arrested if you're a member of the House or the Senate. You don't commit crimes. That doesn't happen. To this day, a member of the House of the Senate could murder somebody and they would not be arrested by any civil law. It's actually kind of amazing, isn't it? There's a, there's a law he took. It's so, remember, the president carries out the law. It couldn't the president just start arresting members of Congress to get what they want? So there's a reason for that. But, and actually it's kind of funny, both the House and the Senate have their own laws. Each of them have their own jail which is basically the little office. And they have a sergeant in arms can actually arrest you. <laughs> Hasn't happened for a while, but they can actually do that. He'd just be censored, censured and sent home, kicked out. And guess what happened? He was reelected and came right back. Not only that, Southern admirer, admirers sent him thousands of new kings. That's how bloody it got, Sumner Brooks. Brooks made, or Sumner made it, but he's never the same. Never the same. Then, right after that, so think about Jayhawkers. They heard, and what did they hear? A massacre in, in Lawrence. And then they heard about this. And that leads to this man. Now that's a very glorious painting of him on the, on the rotunda of the state capitol in Kansas. He did not have a beard when he was in Kansas. But they still drew them that way anyways. As this firebrand that began the Civil War. Who is that? Oh, John Brown's behind. John Brown. That's John Brown. And John Brown's one of the most important characters in American history. It's hard to describe it. How does this work? There we go. John Brown. John Brown, that's what he looked like. 
He actually, what are we checking our phone for? Sorry. Not again. Or I get a phone. Sorry. And so with that, John Brown, that irritates me. Don't do that while I'm trying to work. John Brown was a failed businessman on a number of things, but he saw it as his mission in life to end slavery. He was a confirmed abolitionist, and he and he went to Kansas to fight against the pro-slavery forces. He was a leading Jayhawker, and this was taken to him right before that. He and his 17 children, uh, he had two wives, one down in childbirth. I've mentioned this before, but a third of all women died in childbirth. And it was, yeah, I think you're probably going to understand why. Without antibiotics or anything else. But John Brown went there to fight, and he was a Jayhawker fighting his border ruffians, and he heard massacre. He heard Hunter stuff. We've got to fight back. Look what they did. He heard about Sumner. We got to do something about this. Now, it's only a few days, but with the telegraph, they had newspapers the next day of what happened. He had the information. And for four years, that was my yearbook for me. Until parents got mad and complained and I couldn't get into the yearbook anymore. Wait, wait, what? They said they want, they want to see their kid's face. And a number of people said, um, why is he putting a picture of Abraham Lincoln in there? <laughs> so, yeah, so if you go, it was, it's a while, it's been late 2000s or so, or late 2000, the, the uh, aughts, 2005 or 6, 2007. Yeah, that's my yearbook photo. I like it. Like, literally now? Yeah, that picture, that picture right there, for four years. It could pass for you. That's not bad. And my great, 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 great uncle rode with John Brown. It was even mentioned by John Brown's son, John Brown the second. even mentioned him. As old, pock bark, ugly, short, <laughs> John Partridge. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> he must have had smallpox, but ugly, oh, red face too, and red faced. <laughs> so, John Brown. And what did John Brown do? He wanted revenge. So he and other Jayhawkers went to a, a settlement on Pottawatomie Creek, where there were no pro-slavery people. A couple of them might have been involved in the, in the sack. But remember, they think it's a massacre. Doesn't excuse it. But all kinds of information. Think about it. it's a part of a plot to get us. And a Pottawatomie Creek. So this all happened in just five days. On that night, they slashed apart, murdered five pro slavery men, cut them up with broadswords. So they butchered these people. As they saw, we got to fight back. Now, they weren't 100% innocent, but this is outright murder. And so those who were, especially pro-South, said, look what these Northern abolitionists are. They're a bunch of John Browns, Pottawatomie Brown. And he became the most infamous person in America. But he also became a hero, because just a, a few months later, at Osawatomie Creek, I am not making that up, it really is Osawatomie Creek, John Brown and his other soldiers fought off hundreds of border ruffians and saved a wagon train of free soilers. Osawatomie Brown was the hero to, free, to freedom. So it really depends on what side you're on. You know, people talk about terrorism. In fact, we are so technically, because of this unbelievable law passed in 2001, on a global war against terror, which is still kind of amazing. I'm not sure how you fight an emotion, but uh, terrorism. And terrorism, that's what the British called the patriots. They're terrorists. John Brown, by definition, is a terrorist. But it doesn't depend on what side you're on. Is he a terrorist or is he a freedom fighter? It really depends on what side you're on. Life is complex. That's why it's really hard to fight a thing like terrorism, because it really does depend on what side you're on and what you believe. Brown thought he didn't have power, so we're going to fight back. So there's John Brown. He would later grow that beard and go into hiding. And his name would personify this whole time, John Brown, John Brown, John Brown. But to Southerners, he represented their greatest fear. And so with that, by the way, that's the symbol of Kansas, John Brown. He's gonna, 
Um, after the Civil War, they'll call him this, this religious zealot and a, a lunatic. This complex, but he fought. He was willing to die to end slavery. He was an interesting man. A mini series just came out about him, and I've not watched it yet. And I've heard mixed things about it. Have you know what I'm talking about? I can't remember the name. It was in my head, and as soon as I started talking, it disappeared. Someday you two will be old. But I can tell you things about me in fifth grade. Okay, when it pops in my head, I'll remind, but I heard mixed things about it. So, the constitutional crisis, while civil war is going on, right after Potawatomi and, and Lawrence, they're going to have the first election on the Constitution. And two constitutions they'll vote on, 1856, two constitutions. Now, let's see, you're all very smart people. Can you guess which constitution, based on the town it started, and I gave you the flag for each, was the pro-slavery one? And can anyone guess which one was the free soil one? It's kind of tough, isn't it? Maybe look at the shape of the flag, that sort of. Yeah, admit me free, the other one says Southern rights. Yeah, I'd say this is probably the pro-slavery one. And the thing about it was, is the Pierce administration was, what do you call a northerner who favors the South? Uh, yeah, the great term, dope face. Well, he, Pierce made it very clear. They're not going to stop border ruffians. They're not going to stop border ruffians at all. So that first election was, it was very clear, this is going to be a rigged election for the Compton. He's a dope face. So free soilers boycotted it. We're not going to participate in a fraud. So who won the election? But everyone knew the election was garbage. But Pierce originally certified it and said that would be the territorial constitution. Well, another election was held a little bit, uh, it was made a little bit harder to just cross the border and vote. And the Topeka won by 70, 70 30. It turned out there were significantly more free soilers than border ruffians. But now there are two constitutions. Technically both, technically both have a claim to be legitimate. And for the next four years, they would continue to fight. Now, let me have, we gotta move on from Kansas. But in 1860, Kansas would become a state under the Topeka Constitution. Everyone got that? Kansas would become a state under Topeka. But it would still be in fighting for six more years during the Civil War. Kansas was pretty bad. And with that, wait, what the 1860. And they kept fighting, so all through 1860 up to 65. And so that's a Kansas, and this fighting will go on. But with that, I do like that. There were no set ways to put flags or put stars, so I just like how they did that. I think that's really cool. More and more you'll see this. The first flag of the Confederacy was a blue field with a star. It was called the Bonnie Blue Flag. And then they adopted basically the Texas flag for their, their flag. Yeah. Do we know who designed the Compton No, I wish I did. That's it. So here's a famous cartoon, and it's forcing slavery down the throat of a free soiler. Slavery down the throat of a free soiler. And here is a free soiler, and it's being held back, his head open, and you notice it says Kansas. But it also mentions, remember the filibusters in, in uh, the Austin Manifesto, it says Cuba right there, you see that right there? Boom, boom. And so here are democratic politicians, because that's a democratic party that won a popular sovereignty. Holding back, and you notice it says democratic platform. And so, are they forcing slavery down their throat? They're forcing a slave down their throat, which, by the way, this is pretty intensely racist. And this is what the free soiler says. Murder, help, neighbors, help, oh, my poor wife and children. So that's a free soil cartoon, but also shows that thing about a white republic. Good cartoon to show you the time. So not only that, we have a new political party. 1854, the same year as Kansas-Nebraska, the same year, a new Republican Party formed. 
Remember the old free soilers, which are mostly free soil Democrats? Fury is at Kansas, Nebraska. They join the new Republican Party. There was just a, there, remember what I told you, there weren't very many abolitionists, but they joined the Republican Party too. Charles Sumner would be one of them. And some Whigs, conscience Whigs are Whigs that were basically anti-slavery, free soil. They were conscience Whigs. And the other Whigs who were big into the industrial policy, pro-business policy, some joined the Republicans, some joined the Democrats. And that made up the, uh, the Republican Party. It was a purely, and write this down, Northern Party. Purely a Northern Party. And if it's a Northern Party, well, what is supposed to happen to all the Southern Whigs? What did they do? Yeah, they went to become Democrats. And the Democratic Party became a Southern Party. Complete. Southern Party. And Thomas Nast, remember the guy who did Santa Claus? I showed you that picture before. He made this cartoon, this is 1868, and he was pro-Republican, and he's trying to say vote for Republicans because the Democrats were the party of secession. It's very complex, but, and so here is the Republican vote solid union for the United States, and it's crushing the leaders of the Democratic Party in New York. Now he wanted something like, you know, a steamroller of the Republican Party, and so he drew an elephant. And that cartoon is how the Republican Party got the mascot of the elephant. Remember I showed you the one of uh, Andrew Jackson as a jackass? And the Democrats kind of held on that, said, okay, we'll be the working man's donkey. Well, Republicans took that. So that's where that comes from. And that Ulysses S. Grant, it's complex, it's a long story. But, and that's Sam Tilden. So out of this hill, the Republican ideology will become the Northern ideology. And remember, I talked about the Southern ideology. Remember the positive good theory of slavery? And that all, and you have to know the Southern or the positive good theory. When I talk about the events leading up to the Civil War, or you write about them, and let's say at DBQ, ideologies are key. If you believe something to be true, especially in the South, you believe it to be true, and Northerners are trying to cut your throat in the middle of the night, that's what you fight for. As it turned out, it doesn't matter if it's factually true. They believe it to be true. And Northerners are going to believe this thing too. Ideologies are why people fight. Ideologies are kind of scary. We all have them, but they can be scary. And so with that, right there, Northern ideology. And what are they? They took the version of, of free labor. Remember free labor? Well, the Northern system was creating this dynamic system, this dynamic economic system that allowed workers to do all kinds of jobs and opportunity. And that's what they saw, is we're creating free labor. Now, the problem is early, the early Republicans were thinking pre, they're still kind of thinking free capitalism. But like, you know, anybody can do whatever they want in this new system. Well, that isn't quite true because most, most people can't afford the capital. Most of you probably can't afford to go start a car company because you couldn't afford the machines. Can anyone afford those machines? I was hoping someone would say yes after you can make a deal. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you're a but, but they really emphasize workers' rights. So it was kind of a weird combination of the Whig idea of free labor, the system of opportunity. And I said this three times opportunity, so make sure you put it down. They really stressed, we want this opportunity. I think I got that. Yeah, opportunity. Thank goodness. I knew I was thinking it. Opportunity. It provides opportunity. So it's a bastardization of the original Whig policy of being pro-capitalism with the democratic idea of free workers, of workers having rights. Yeah, Republican Party really was this combination. It was not yet the party of business, which it would become in the eight, by the 1880s. So on that note, Please look at the things for the DBQs. Please look at the elephant. By the way, right now, don't think of the elephant. Did it work? You ever had that say, don't think of something, what's the first thing you think of? Bull <laughs> Yeah, bull moose. Speaking of moose, you want to see a good picture of a moose? Yes. <laughs> 
interesting how the Yeah, they're so lame now. I'm with you there. The Progressive Party is in 1900 started by Teddy uh, Roosevelt. Here we go. You want to see the cool loose picture? Ooh. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Josh, Josh, wait. But have you ever seen, I've seen the geese in Osprey now. It's the damnedest thing. So I, I have been, I, I have been very confused on how like political parties have been changing geographically. Yeah. So Sam Jackson, that used to be the Democrats in the North, you know, North and South. Okay. And then it changed how to the North. But if you look at today, you have all of the ones up there. That are pretty darn democratic yeah. now. So since they switched out to Democrats, Republicans, Democrat again, yeah. and so she's like, how, how that worked out? Like, well, it's it's, it's hard to show you an admitted between classes. Yeah. But think about uh, what happens is is that the issues around the country change, and and so for this one, to many northern Democrats, many northern regional Democrats, they saw the Republican Party. I'm sorry, they saw. Uh, Northern Democrats saw the Democratic Party as just becoming a party for the elite slave hole, and it was leading its true path. Mm -hmm. And so they switched to another party. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you see in time after time, when you have uh, an attitude or a feeling that one of the parties is leaving its roots and they go and they change parties. Mm -hmm. So like in the South, uh, because the Republican Party was the party of union, mm -hmm. there was only a Democratic Party in the South in the 1960s. There were, there were no Republicans. There was no Republican Party in the South. And, um, but most of them were pretty like anti civil rights and things like that. Mm -hmm. When Northern Democrats started saying, no, we're the party of the people, we should be the party for equal rights for everybody, then the Democrats down South switched to the Republican. Okay. And in fact, that was the issue. In fact, um, yeah, there was civil, anti civil rights. We were going to help. There's a lot of other issues. Yeah. That's what. And, and the other thing, too, you know, Montana was a big union state. Mm -hmm. We were very democratic. Unions are dead, wages are lower, and we're Republican. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened here. Okay. Yeah. See ya. See ya.